please like and share the video. Friends, family, people who love history, mystery, and the unknown. Also subscribe. It's free to the channel. If you don't, this could happen to you the next time you visit Taco Bell. Hey guys and gals, it's your buddy Drew from Living Histories Mysteries and Three Eyed Raven Productions. I had to reshoot this intro. Um, the video that we're going to premiere here is about loss, it's about mystery. It's about dealing with the unknown. The reason I had to reshoot this intro is because the day that I decided to put this video together, which was yesterday, um, I received I received a phone call that now our family is dealing with our, our own mystery, our own unknown. Um, two days ago, my 80 year old aunt, who has been the sole care for her husband who is in uh, stage three cancer. For some reason, walked upstairs in their home Saturday morning and, well, ended it. The family has no clue why. She was always one for beauty, always one for love, always one for life. She was the first entrepreneur in our family. She ran the only nursery in our town, Fairmount, Indiana, James Dean's hometown, for 40 years. She provided all the flower arrangements, Christmas trees, uh, gray blankets, floral bouquets, everything for proms for 40 years, for funerals, for weddings, for everything. Even just sold flowers to individuals for their own flower gardens. And for some reason, decided that she would do the unthinkable. Leave behind four children, a husband with stage three cancer, 
a legacy. This is a woman that I highly admired. So, in working on this video about mystery and the unknown, now we're dealing with our own. I wanted, I believe, in total disclosure with my channel, my people, my family here on the platform. And that's the reason that I wanted to reshoot this intro and let everybody know exactly what was going on. Is it going to slow me down? No, it isn't. But let's put a whole new meaning to mystery and the unknown. Hope you guys enjoy the video. Now, almost 
two and a half days later, a farmer happened to be walking in his land and he came across a large oak tree that he often walked by. And at the bottom of that oak tree, he noticed what appeared to be a small body. He walked over to the oak tree, looked down, and he rolled over what he thought was a dead body. And it was little Thelma, still alive. Um, he immediately rushed her to the hospital where they found that she had a temperature of 101. She was missing one shoe. Her clothes were absolutely tattered and torn apart. Now, the really strange thing about this case is not only did Thelma survive, she had been potentially protected by this large oak tree, but she had been three and a half miles away from her home where she had disappeared in a very rural area kind of through a massive thing of woods, three and a half miles of woods, creeks, and lakes. Um, there were several reservoirs between her home and where she was found. Now, the doctor in the medical report writes that her temperature being 101 might have been due to exposure. Now, the problem with this is, is that when someone has exposure, so, you know, cold elements, their temperature often drops. It's the opposite. But for some reason, Thelma's temperature was 101. There's not a lot of information on this, but Thelma ends up, you know, living and being okay. But her clothes were tattered and she was missing a shoe. So this leads us to wonder, why was this child gone for two and a half days and able to survive in this severe weather with not the proper clothing on? And why was she found with a temperature of 101? It's a very strange circumstance, and it was almost as if she had been placed in that location because this farmer would walk his land the same pattern every day. She wasn't there the day before or the day before that. It was like she was left in this protective spot for some reason. Another really weird thing is, is especially when it involves children in the missing 411, you will start to perceive also that there's always an article of clothing missing, a shoe, socks, or they're found placed um, facing down. Uh, it's, it's really weird. Uh, so this is one of those situations, though, where thankfully the child was found alive. Uh, you know, ad abduction is one thing that comes to some people's mind, but I, it's just strange, okay? Uh, why would a person do that, right? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And I just don't see a 21-month-old baby girl going from a home three and a half miles away through the woods, potentially around lakes and reservoirs, and surviving a snowstorm at that for over two and a half days. Um, it's just a very strange circumstance. So that is our first story. We'll now go into our second story of the day. Roy Bilgren was a two-year-old boy who was playing outside of his house in Wisconsin. His mother had just been with him, but she stepped back in the house to take care of some minor errands real quick and was coming right back out front. While she was heading back towards the door, she heard a loud scream from the neighbor girl. And so she ran to the front door, and to her horror, she witnessed a tall black creature carrying her two-year-old boy in its mouth. She just screamed, and she began running after it. Her mother instincts kicked in, and for three blocks, she chased this creature down, screaming at the top of her lungs until they reached the forest edge. Now keep in mind, this is a rural area with some houses and a cul-de-sac. The creature hanging the boy from its mouth reached a wire fence, and at that point, deciding it probably wasn't worth it, it's got this woman screaming at it, it dropped the boy and just leaped over the fence and walked away into the forest, disappearing. Now, the really strange thing about this story is, is that different articles say different things. One article says it was described as a bear. Another article describes it as a wolf. But from what we know from Roy's mother is she described it as a tall black creature. Now, what is really weird about this is, is that me and you both know the difference between a wolf and a bear, right? If you saw a wolf carrying your child, you would say, oh, there was a wolf or a dog. Or if it was a bear, you would know it was a bear. Now, there are circumstances in which bears are confused with Bigfoot, etc., you know, because they sometimes walk on two feet. But in this circumstance, luckily, Roy survived, two years old. But to this day, we don't know what took Roy, uh, what attempted to kidnap him, and why. And this just feeds into that whole 
these young children being picked up and taken away by things. Look, look at little Thelma, the story we covered first. She, her clothes were all torn up, but she had been placed intentionally there. She was kept warm somehow through the terrifying snowstorm. What would have happened to Roy? In not all cases do these things end well. Um, sometimes these children are never found or their remains are found later, way off in places they just couldn't reach on their own. It's a very strange situation. And in Roy's case, he was extremely lucky that somebody happened to witness him being taken by a creature. And because of that scream and that mother's uh, bravery, she did not let up. She chased it for three blocks. And we still don't know what it was. And that's what I find most interesting about this case. I just feel like somebody would know. So in Roy's case, he was very lucky. I mean, not so lucky to get taken in the first place, but lucky to have not been hurt during the process. This thing had picked him up apparently from his shirt. He didn't suffer any wounds. The neighbor girl couldn't even describe apparently what this thing was. So that is our second story of the day. And it seems that these disappearances in Wisconsin are very similar. Same age groups again little cluster area in this rural part of Wisconsin. Again, throughout the United States, there are just these hot pockets, and again, I'll put up the map, where people are disappearing and their cases are oddly similar, and it's always cluster effects. But that's the second story, so let's get into our third story of the day. In Washburn, Wisconsin, a three-year-old boy by the name Harold King disappeared while at his grandparents' house. He had been playing in the living room, doing this thing, and his grandparents walked in and noticed that he had disappeared. They freaked out. They immediately called law enforcement. They didn't even bother to look. They just called law enforcement immediately. They came in, and a massive search kicked off. Now, we had local law enforcement bringing canines out. There were search and rescue teams, and... They didn't find anything the first day. And on the second day, a massive rainstorm came in and hit really hard. This area was extremely rural. It's known kind of as a farmy swamp area. So you've got some farm area on one area that's very fertile. And then in the north, there is just an immense amount of swamps and thick forest. So during the rain, it was just really hampered the surge. Now, some neighbors in the area began hearing wailing coming from one of the swamps several days later, so two to three days after he had disappeared, and, you know, this caught the eye of people. The search dogs refused to search. They kept giving up. They stopped trying to follow any scent whatsoever, so these searchers had to go manually. They began going off of what they were hearing, and they just heard this wailing coming from the swamp, and they all tuned in into it, and they followed it, and eventually they see on this little island down the middle of the swamp, this two-year-old boy, sorry, three-year-old boy, sitting out in the swamp, only wearing a diaper. Now, they get over to Harold, and they look at him, and he's only wearing his diaper. He's fairly clean-looking, uh, but all of his clothes are missing. He was wearing a shirt, pants, socks, and shoes when he had disappeared, but he was just in a diaper, no clothes whatsoever, but somewhat clean, but cold. And Harold had just been sitting out on this island, apparently, for two days, somehow gotten there without drowning in the swamp, essentially, on this little island. And it, it's just really strange, because in the Missing 411 series, these swamps and these briar patches are just, they come up constantly. And even the author himself notes that he did not look for similar cases that met the same criteria. He was just looking at disappearances, and he kept seeing the same thing pop up in these areas. It's very weird. So... Again, in this case, we have missing articles of clothing, swamp patch, and bloodhounds not picking up scent whatsoever or refusing to do it, almost as if they're nervous or something. So, Harold, again, another case in which he was found alive. He was okay when he was taken to the hospital. He had exposure. His temperature was low. So, opposite of the other case that we talked about. Um, but other than that, he would go on to live a normal life. They said he was delirious. He was suffering um, some problems from 
when, when you hear the word delirious used in these medical reports, especially in this time frame, basically he was probably saying something he saw and it didn't make sense to the doctors. And of course, they made no uh, report of it. So we don't know his story. But what we do know is, is it mimics these very strange factors that seem to happen on a lot of the missing 411 cases. So chalk this one up to another really strange um, story. Thankfully, he was found okay, but how did he get out to that island? Why did the dogs not pick up his scent? And two, where did his clothing go? It was never found again. Um, and they searched that whole area very thoroughly. Uh, and what was causing him to wail? I mean, screaming is one thing, crying is another. They chose the word wailing. Why, why did that one? You know what wailing means, I would hope. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot different than crying. It's, it's actually quite... It's like almost disturbing, if you will. But anyway, so, you know, because that story was very short and didn't have a ton of details into it, we'll just do another one in this case, because guess what? There's so many. In 1956, Judy Raskinall was 16 years old when she was walking to her school bus stop. She was going to get on the bus and go to school. You know, like most teenagers, she walked to the bus stop. She happened to live in a very rural area. Well, Judy never arrived at school that day, and she never came home from school that day. Her parents picked up pretty quickly that something was wrong, contacted law enforcement, and they began a massive search looking for Judy. They brought in bloodhounds, and a massive rainstorm came in and kind of just messed things up a little bit. But the search continued for Judy despite that, and the bloodhounds found nothing. They couldn't find a scent, nothing. However, one day the bloodhounds picked up a scent kind of close to a creek near the house, and it led them to a pair of socks and shoes. This was concerning because why would Judy take off her socks and shoes in the middle of winter? It was the end of November, so very cold, and in this particular area, not comfortable. Uh, she had been near a creek, which is one of those things that also pops up in the missing 401 cases because footprints are extremely hard to find near creeks. Well, they continued searching the area, and they did not find anything. Uh, the worst was feared for Judy. She was 16 years old, and all they had found was her socks and shoes, and foul play was pretty much what most people thought at the time. Um, it was very uncommon for a girl her age to disappear in that type of circumstance. Several days would go by, and a farmer would be going into his barn when he would find Judy in the corner huddled into a, a ball, essentially, and he contacted law enforcement. They came out, they took her to a hospital, and the doctors described her state as being in shock and exposure. Um, they don't know how Judy got there. Um, if you actually look at a map from her home to where she was found, she would have to cross through several swamps creeks and very thick forest in this particular area. Judy um, was described as having a blackout. So this is something that we have seen in some other stories that we've talked about here on this channel uh, where someone can't explain what happened to them, their situation. They just, they had a blackout. It's not a word we use in today's medical terms very often. You just don't hear about it. But in these missing person cases, these blackouts happen all the time. Why would a 16-year-old girl uh, take off her shoes and socks and walk in a creek in the middle of winter and disappear for two days? It's just not something would happen. Um, we don't have a ton of information about, like, you know, her home life or anything like that. But what we do know is she disappeared in the middle of winter. And uh, luckily she survived, but, you know, that whole blackout thing, it's something that we see in these cases. It's almost as if these people are, like, put in, an, in a trance, if you will. Like, uh, you know, as we go through these missing 411 cases, you're going to hear me say several different things, okay? Creatures, trances, uh, it, it's just really hard. It's really hard to pinpoint one thing that it could be. And it almost frustrates me in a way because I want to know myself as we're going through these cases, you guys, like I don't have a set belief in what is causing it. I would love to know what you guys think is happening in these cases. It just doesn't make sense to me. You know, we were all teenagers once and some of us threw tantrums and fits and we did things to get attention. But come on, two to three days, 
in this case, I feel like something happened to her. And just keep in mind, too, like, her medical thing says nothing about her having sexually assaulted or anything. She was just missing her shoes and socks. And she'd been missing for several days and found huddled up in a barn with exposure and shock. And they only could describe it as being a blackout state. She had no idea. She never had another one again in her whole life. Just this one instance. She was walking to the bus one early morning and blacked out, doesn't remember anything. It's very weird. So anyway, uh, these are the cases for Wisconsin today. There are several others. Um, maybe I'll do a part two on Wisconsin alone, but for today, that is it. And I just want to say, what do you guys think is going on in these cases? Uh, just a quick recap. I mean, we had several situations where children disappeared from their home broad daylight um, and I think this is the first video where every single case ended with someone surviving their case pretty interesting but almost none of them able to explain how it happened or why so just no explanations whatsoever it is a very strange situation for me again this is where my brain goes from okay so it's not a simple abduction there's also a mysterious element to this where people can't remember or describe what they're saying and when it comes to children there are stories of children as young as two and three explaining to doctors who i mean these are when they're found alive these just crazy stories of seeing witches in caves and being fed mushrooms and creatures protecting them and keeping them warm like we're going to get into those um but we're just working our way through this so it's just terribly interesting to me and as far as judy goes that's a strange one a 16 year old girl is nearly an adult she should be able to explain her situation but we just don't have that uh enough information to go off of but she does fall in the missing 411 category because she disappeared under very strange circumstances in a very swampy area uh, with a creek. So, in today's video, that is what we got going on, guys. Uh, let me know down below what you thought is going on. Welcome back. Like I was saying in the beginning, a lot of times we have to deal with our own mysteries our own steps into the unknown the unexplainable not only have am i dealing with the ant thing i've also been very ill for the last three or four days that's why i missed my live streams this past Monday, um, and then dealing with my hearing about my aunt uh, Monday afternoon kind of put it er to my uh, Monday evening thing. How we deal with these situations on a personal level is all different. We can never forget we have friends. We have family that help us through these situations. Don't always give us the answers we need, but it helps to relieve the journey to finding closure. I'd like to thank you guys for joining me in this video. We are just getting into the 35 days of Halloween here on Living History's Mysteries. And the stories and the videos are just going to get better. We still got a long way to go before the end of the season. As always, I'd like to say, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. God bless you, God love you, we do. Happy Halloween.
coming Sunday, October 2nd, 2022, from 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. It's the Cass County Fall Festival, visiting the historic Civil War era Newton House, located at 20689 Marcellus Highway in Decatur, Michigan. Bring your family and friends along and enjoy this free to the public event. It'll include festive music, artisans, food and cider, hay rides, kids' activities, guided tours of the Newton House. You never know, Mr. Newton, our former state legislator, may even be there. It'll have Civil War reenactors, historic reenactors, something for everyone. So bring your family out Sunday, October 2nd from 1 to 4.30 p.m. to the Cass County Fall Festival, sponsored by the Cass County Historical Society.